another great show lined up for you tonight. So, don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Delessio, and I'm the host of Rob's Inner Circle Broadcasting Worldwide. I'd like to welcome our worldwide audience. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to what is going to be an absolutely exciting show. I'd like to give the usual shout out to my good friend and producer of Rob's Inner Circle, Jenny Duhame, and to the podcast tech and our show, Patty, Lady Starlight Saragossa. We have an announcement tonight. From April 24th to April 30th, it marks the National Organ and Tissue Donation and Awareness Week. We'd like to give our heartfelt condolences to the families, friends, and sport fans of both the late Mike Bossy and Guy Lafleur, who have passed on during the last two weeks, both due to lung cancer. Mike Bossy spent his entire 10-year career with the New York Islanders, with whom he won four consecutive Stanley Cups between 1980 and 1983. Guy Lafleur spent 17 seasons with the Montreal Canadiens, with whom he won five Stanley Cups, and those were consecutive Stanley Cups. And he played the remainder of his career with the Quebec Nordiques and the New York Rangers. His career spanned between 1971 and 1991. We would like to take this moment to observe their passing, so please join us in silence as we remember our hockey heroes. We'd like to wish happy birthday to the following people, artists and actresses, Jessica Loftcross and Anik Matern, Pro Dunker Jordan Kilgannon, film directors Noah E. Waters III and Ashling Chinley, photographer Karen Benedict, and radio personality Kim Rossi. On behalf of myself and everybody here at Rob's Inner Circle, we wish you the very, very best and great wishes to you all. Be sure to watch Daily Struggles, this sitcom everyone is talking about on the Rise Up TV channel on the Roku streaming service. You can download the Roku app on your smart devices or you can get the Roku stick on Amazon for as little as $30. Make sure you watch all of our productions on the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel. We invite you to comment, share, Click on the like button, subscribe to Bobby Short Shorts, and hit the notification bell because that way, anytime there's a new production coming out, you will be the first to know. Well, folks, it's that time. Once again, it's time to sit back, relax, kick up your feet on the edge of the table, open up that beer, that bottle of wine, pour yourself a glass, take a deep breath, relax, sit back, and enjoy the show. Let us carry the weight. Ladies and gentlemen, it is showtime. It is time to bring on our guest on our show this evening. She is an amazing part of the Montreal community. She's been around in the casting business for a few years. She's got quite a bit of experience in the business. She's a casting director. She's an amazing painter and also an absolutely delightful person. Ladies and gentlemen, Please help me welcome tonight's star attraction and Rob's Inner Circle, Miss Rosina Bucci. <laughs> Rosina, thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you for being on our show. We are so honored. Well, I'm honored and very pleased to be on your show as well. Thank you for that great introduction. I'm blushing. <laughs> it is a well deserved uh, introduction. And let me not forget, let us not forget, that is Jenny, myself and Patty, we would love to wish you a happy belated birthday, Rosina. Oh, you thought we you. forgot you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't forget you. <laughs> it's, you know, it's birthday month. Let's put it that way. Everybody's it, birthday should be celebrated at least for a month. <laughs> uh, actually, Jenny was telling me that April is our busiest month here on the show with birthdays. There's a lot of people really? who were born in April. 
So I wonder why. Uh, well, they're all amazing. They're all very talented as well. <laughs> so, Rosina, listen, you and I go back quite a while. We go back to 2013, and to this very day, mm -hmm. I am still so grateful to you because I remember, I remember I was uh, auditioning for a role on Being Human right? as the plumber. <laughs> I don't, I don't, do you remember that audition? I know you've auditioned about 35,000 people since then, but do you remember that? I audition? do, actually. I do. I remember really? it. Yes, I do. I remember, uh, you know, you, you were submitted. And I remember looking at the picture, looking, and I said, yeah, let's try this guy out. <laughs> and you came in and you did a terrific job. And uh, I presented your audition to All Concerned and you were cast. And you did a wonderful job on set as well. And uh, rumor has it that you were very insecure during that process. Well, <laughs> let, let me share this with you and with our listeners this evening, Rosina. Um, listen, I came into that audition. I was absolutely prepared. Uh, my agent and I worked very, very hard. We made sure that I knew the lines. I was, I, you know, I felt good about the whole thing. And then what happened is that when I was sitting down in the waiting room, I started seeing some actors that <laughs> I recognized, some that I actually saw on TV, Another of them had a comedy show on CJD radio. Okay, I'll name his name. It's Joey Elias. He was there. And he was auditioning, I believe, for the same role. It's and possible. I, yeah. and I got so intimidated. <laughs> and I came into the audition room and everybody was excited there. And then all of a sudden, I just started, I started feeling so insecure. I cannot explain why. And I fumbled my lines. I could not remember the lines. I just... At one point, I said, you know what, the uh, with this, I just said, I'm just going to do something that sounds like it, that feels like it. So I went ahead and I did it. It was nothing at all that was in the lines. I just improvised. I walked out of there. I called up my agent. Like you told me, how many actors feel like giving up? I called mm -hmm. my agent. I go, that's it. I'm giving up. And lo and behold, two months later, against all odds, I get the phone call by wardrobe telling me that I was supposed to go for a fitting for the guy playing the plumber. I go, what are you talking what about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? <laughs> goes, well, did anyone call you? You got the part. I go, what? You got the part. I call my agent right away. We were celebrating. It was absolutely crazy. She and I have this thing together. Every time we get an audition, I bring her maple donuts. So ah. The that goes on. and. <laughs> The reason why I'm sharing this with the audience is that a lot of times we think that we might have messed up an audition. And even before we came on uh, on air, you, know, you were telling me how important it is, even if you mess up, how important it is to go all the way to the end. So yes, explain to us why that's important. Well, you know, uh, j just to backtrack a little bit, uh, it's easier said than done. But the advice to to actors who go into audition is to Focus on what you have to do and not allow yourself to be distracted by everything that's around you. And it's easy to get uh, intimidated. You know, you, you look around, you start second guessing yourself. There are people in the room that don't look like you and you're saying, well, what am I doing here? They're looking for somebody different because there's nobody else here like me. And if everybody kind of looks like you, you're saying, well, what chance do I have? Because... Everybody else here is competing with me uh, and all kinds of stuff that takes away from the business at hand. And the business at hand is, you know, you go in, you do your scene and you go home and you forget about it. You know, many actors will never know this, but they go into an audition. They, you know, they just like put that in the uh, the whole pack saying, ah, you know, it's like a. I, I just went there again. I wasted my time, whatever. But a lot of them don't know that many times they've come very, very close mm -hmm. to taking a gig. It, it all comes down to maybe they wanted a blonde actor, a blonde hair actor instead of dark hair. So does that happen often in the casting world? of Rosie? Look, first of all, you can only cast one person in every role, right? So, uh even if there are only three people being seen for the role, your chances are 33% of getting it. So sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't. But what is important is that uh, you've got to show 
the best of what you can do every time. And it doesn't matter whether it's a small role, a big role, whatever it is, you just go in and you've got to give the best of yourself. The, the worst thing an actor can do is to say, oh, and, I, I, and this has actually been said, oh, that, you know, that's so easy, I can do it with my eyes closed. Well, <laughs> don't do it with your eyes closed. Do it with your eyes open. And, you know, because if your attitude is that, it's, it's going to come through. You know, the, the actor's instrument is themselves. And what you're thinking and what your attitude is, it comes through, no matter what the scene is. So, you know, come in with a good attitude, be prepared, and do, do what you have to do, and off you go. And if you flub a line, just keep going. Well, that's one thing I learned. It's like by improvising that day, and anyone who asks me, I'm just going to tell them the same thing. I mean, you've, you've worked hard, you know, to, to go to the audition. Don't just go throw it away. I mean, at least do something. You know, you never know. Like, I got lucky. If I got lucky, anybody can get lucky. I, well, lucky. You know, it, it's you're lucky, but the point is you, you made the effort, right? And if you... That's the whole thing, yes. If there's no effort made... Luck, <laughs> luck is not to be seen. Well, coming from the casting director, I like your version better than the way I thought of it. Like mm -hmm. being lucky because yeah, I guess you have a different perspective because you're in the business of casting. I'm going to go along with what you said. I like that better mm -hmm. than what I said. <laughs> so Rosina, tell me, are you the type of casting director that expects his actors to come in for an audition that stay true to the script or... Are you, are you willing to, to hear an actor that's going to go a little bit off track? He's going to add his own flavor in there, maybe some improv, or do you just want the actors to stay to the, uh, to the lines, true to the script? Again, it depends on what the project is. Uh, with some projects, you, you need to kind of, you know, loosen up and, and, uh, we encourage people to, you know, throw in a little aside or to, you know, to, to uh, improvise a little bit. But for some projects, no. For some projects, it's so, it's written so tightly. The dialogue is written so tightly that if you mess with it, it'll break the rhythm of, of, of the whole scene. So what an actor needs to do, first of all, an actor needs to, a, be disciplined. So if it's scripted dialogue, you should learn it. Have it memorized, have it out of the way. And then when you come in, if you're working with other actors and, and you're, you know, you're told to just go ahead, just play with it, to be prepared, to just be flexible and do whatever the situation calls for. Uh, these days we don't do live auditions so much because you know the last two years we won't discuss the situation it you know it's it's been a different uh way of doing things but when we were doing in room auditions uh the the actors who would come in and be the first ones to audition for a specific role uh sometimes we'd spend a little bit more time with them and and play with it to see what worked best for that scene, you know? And when you're dealing with original works, uh, sometimes you're not sure if, if a scene isn't working, if, if an audition scene isn't working, whether it's because the actor isn't right, whether, uh, you know, the problem is with the writing or with the delivery. So, you know, you, you work with it. So all that to say is yeah. some actors come in and, and say, well, we're going to wing it and I'm going to improvise as a way of not having done their homework. And that never works. When you improvise, it's because you've done your homework, you've learned the lines, and then you play with it to see if you can bring something different to it. We have a member of the audience who has written something absolutely beautiful over here, Don Emilio Zeno. He goes, hello, Rosina. Glad to see you've kept your youth and charm since I first met you 
40 years ago. God bless. Well, God bless you too, Don Emilio. We met in kindergarten. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear about this. <laughs> no. <laughs> Talk to us, Rosina. Talk to us. Uh, no, uh, I'm just making a little joke about having met 40 years ago. It would have had to be in kindergarten because we're both way too young to have met 40 years ago uh, in the business. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So when you opened up Elite Casting, you got together with Nadia Rona and Vera Miller. How did you get to meet these two wonderful women? And how did you start Elite Casting? We Tell met, the, the, the three of us, uh, I keep saying the two of us because they're twins, right? Oh. Everybody knows that, no? Except me. <laughs> you didn't know that? I didn't know that. They're identical twins. What? Yes, they are identical twins. They don't have identical last names. No, <laughs> okay. they don't. Okay. I don't know. Do you have sisters? I don't have any sisters. I just oh, got okay. a brother. I'm just saying there were, yeah. you know. Uh, so they're twins. Oh, my God. So okay. When women married, they would take on their husband's names. So okay. it wouldn't, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. identical twins. Absolutely. So, so <laughs> yeah. So, um, so we met uh, in an acting workshop. And we would take, we were taking classes together. We were in place together. Uh, I directed them. We, you know, so we knew each other that way. And uh, we clicked. We became really good friends. And uh, then we decided to do something together because we loved it so much. And we um, opened up a dinner theater in Montreal. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. And we produced... We produced the plays ourselves, we cast the plays, we put our money into it, and uh, the dinner theater ran for about two, two and a half years, very successfully. And then the hotel where we held it was sold and they decided to uh, re, uh, you know, re use the space for, for a different purpose. But we had a wonderful run and uh, we worked with some really wonderful people. Uh, Terry Donald, uh, who is very well known in the acting community, directed a whole bunch of plays for us. And then there was uh, the late and wonderful Roger Peace, uh, who we worked with. Roger Peace had a knack for making, you know, making a production look like we had spent like a million bucks on it just because he came from um he came from a very long line of experience in terms of uh he worked with some really greats uh in the states and in england anyway so he he we worked with him and that was that was the beginning uh of of uh elite elite, uh... elite. we started off as elite productions and then became elite casting because we started doing more and more castings as the business in Montreal uh, grew and, and the demand for casting came about. Because prior to that, in the early 80s, there, there were no casting directors. So the, here in Montreal, there, there was maybe one, but it was not, you know, it was not something, an ongoing thing, whereas today, Every production uses casting people, and there are quite a few of us in the city. So uh, you're talking about the early 80s. Mm -hmm. So that would make elite casting an experienced casting house. I would say so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you develop the passion to become a casting director? I, it's the sort of thing that if you love the business, you know, you, you love acting, you love being in the business, we, we loved being on stage. Uh, it kind of all comes together. So when we found our uh, nook, our niche in casting, because the opportunity presented itself, well, then, you know, you, you develop that uh, aspect of the business for yourself. 
Our good friend Esther, who's tuned in, uh, has made a comment. Esther Brzezinski, my co-host on Noon Hour Out of the Box. Thanks for joining <laughs> us, Esther. Great supporter that you are. You're a warrior. Okay, so Esther says, I worked at the dinner theater for a very short time, and it took a couple of classes. And she took a couple of classes at Elite. Mm -hmm. Jeez, I think it was 40 years ago. And she she is, she says, she yeah, was I was in kindergarten. kindergarten. <laughs> yeah, well, she was in kindergarten taking some classes. Yes, That's interesting. absolutely. <laughs> Did you remember Esther? Uh, yes, 40 of course. Years ago? You do? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. So uh, tell me, these days, the new trend is self-tapes. There's no more, uh, because I understand that you don't have your, uh, your office on the St. Lawrence Boulevard anymore. You close it up. Well, yeah, we don't have a physical office anymore. But even with that, uh, we were using studio spaces. However, with, with, uh, with the COVID situation, everything is done remotely. And uh, so people are requested to do self-tapes. Uh, we will do callbacks when we do callbacks on Zoom or, or some other platform similar to that. So it's all done remotely, which is, which is a different... Uh, experience a different vibe from how it used to be when things were done live and it has its pros and cons so there are many advantages to it and some disadvantages but you know I like to focus on the advantages uh, and the advantages being uh, what Rosina exactly uh, name two or three advantages that you think two are or three advantages. well first of all uh, nobody ever gets caught in a snowstorm on zoom yes definitely okay or has a flat tire or anything like that. So uh, just in terms of, of um, you know, time efficiency, uh, the actor could be up north, the, they could be in a different city and, you know, you still get their self tapes. But if you're doing a, a call back on Zoom, they can all come in at the time that you need them. All you need is a good, uh, you do need a good Wi-Fi connection because otherwise you're screwed. But, <laughs> and you, yeah. And uh, you, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I didn't want to cut you off. So, uh, we're going to say it's more important. Go ahead, Rosina. Yeah. So, um, so it, it saves a lot of time that way. Uh, and you don't have to worry about where people are because prior to that, when you set up a casting session, you know, this one, uh, this one happened to be in Ottawa for the day or that one happened to, you know, to couldn't make it from up north or somebody was caught in a snowstorm. And, and it was, you know, if you're driving a half hour or so to come to an audition for, for, you know, three lines, it just seemed like an inordinate amount of time to, to spend not actually auditioning. Whereas uh, now you can spend the time, you know, you set yourself up and, and, and there you are. So it saves time. But in terms of not being caught in snowstorms or getting a flat tire, you just better hope to God that that virus in your computer doesn't decide to <laughs> pop up on the day you got to go on that Zoom to do yeah. your audition. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but, you know, people have a cell phone or, you know, hopefully you can sort it out a little bit more easily. And from my, from my perspective as a casting director... I, I find that I'm able to see a lot more auditions. Exactly. Because uh, when you when you do a live casting session, you you set it up and you know you give ten minutes per person. There are only so many people that you can fit in a day. Uh, but ultimately, each audition, once it's taped, is maybe you know two minutes, three minutes three and a half minutes is about the time of auditions. I can view a lot of auditions in a day, way more than if I had to be there in person or, you know, people are late. And so I, I can see at least double the people I, I, was, I was seeing before, which is great for the actors and it's, and it's great for me. Because I get to, um, if you're limited in the number of people, you can see by time, because we have deadlines also. So it's not like, oh, I'll do three days of casting. Sometimes you don't have the time to, to take that much time to, for the process. 
Uh, but if I'm able to view way more people through self-tapes, I can see people that I would maybe have had to cut out because of time uh, confinement. So it, I love it. And I get to see people that I might not otherwise have seen. Uh, we encourage the audience to uh, put up your comments. If you have any questions for Rosina, please feel free to ask her questions. We got a, a, a significant amount of time left on our show. So if you have any questions, want to make any comments, please feel free. So Rosina, does it happen that, uh, well, not anymore, but, or maybe, okay, back in the day you had the audition room, right now in the self-tape. Does uh -huh. it happen the moment that you see an actor or actress popping up in front of you, does it happen that you look at this person and say, oh my God, that is the actor I want for this role and that actor has not even spoken a word yet. Does that happen sometimes? It does. It does. <laughs> <laughs> not every day, but it does. Now, what does happen is um, there's, um, you can tell somebody that has star quality even if they're not right for that role somebody comes on the screen and even before they open their mouths or even after they've opened their mouths there's just something about them that's really uh, uh just star quality is all that you can call it that they're just magnetic on the screen and they draw you in and yeah that that you can tell it happens. Yes, it happens. <laughs> it does. Do you remember a specific audition that an actor came in and that actor was not exactly well known back in the day and he or she went on to do some A1 projects, A1 list projects that today is doing miniseries, is in huge movies. Do you remember an actor that wasn't well known and that moved up the ladder? Well, you know, most actors who move up the ladder start off not being known that they start off not being known. Uh, I remember I was uh, working in Toronto uh, and uh, I brought in this actress. She came into audition. It, this was for um, a television series that was, uh, what do you call that? Uh, you know, a different, a different cast every week. It was anthology. And she came in and she read and everybody flipped over her. And so I remember my producer saying, if this person doesn't make it big, it's because she will have had bad management. And that was Jill Hennessy. Oh. <laughs> you know, and Jill Hennessy has gone on you know, to do all kinds of things. But she was in Toronto and she had done... Uh, a music video, she had done some modeling, uh, but she was very talented. She had a great look, she had a great voice, uh, and she had acting chops and she worked at it. Uh, and she had ambition too, you know? So she went on to New York and uh, <laughs> the story is that she, she was accompanying somebody else in an audition and they ended up hiring her on a show, anyway. She, she's gone on to do really, really well. But people start off not, you know, not being famous. You're not born famous. So uh, some, of it, some of it is, um, if you're charismatic, that's something that you have. But hard work is something that you have to put in because you're not just going to... Uh, get by just on your charisma it'll might you know it might get you a little bit of attention but it's not going to sustain you so the actors that i've met over the years who've gone on to do really really well they've put in the work they've put in a lot of work and they've made sacrifices so yeah we have mm -hmm. nadia rona i don't know if that name rings a bell to you who's tuned in and she's made a couple <laughs> of beautiful she? comments who is nadia, nadia? <laughs> i don't know i never heard of her who is she? so nadia goes on to say so nice uh, for vera and myself to be here we are thrilled to be part of elite casting and this is also a second part to it we had 
so many wonderful years together. So in honor of Vera and, um, and uh, Nadia, who are tuned in tonight, what memory can you go back to say that was your most memorable memory with these two amazing women? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you, the most memorable. I don't know that there's one most Okay, memorable. so just name two you know, then, if you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, as I said, you know, we, we, uh, we came up through the ranks together, and uh, sometimes you just click with people. And uh, we, we, all three of us had a, an incredible passion and uh, were willing, you know, to, to, to put in the time to uh, be in this business. And uh, we had such a, had and still do, had such a wonderful connection that people were very confused as to, you know, what were we? Were we sisters? Uh, no, no, they're cousins. No, she's the sister-in-law. You know, they didn't know because it's like you can't just be business partners uh, and, you know, friends. But it's like it was more than that. So, you know, it's been many, many years and uh, we're bosom pals. And, well, and we've gone through a lot together. You know, there, there are... Uh, in, when you're do, having a business, there, there are a lot of ups and downs that have exactly. nothing to do with the friendship. But like, you know, uh, so we, we've gone through a lot of struggles, but it was great when you have um, when you have the support of people that you're working with that are there and support you as opposed to stab you in the back, which we know can happen in this <laughs> business and it, in every it sure business. Can. So, yeah. So, um, unfortunately, in some cases, some actors are cast for some roles, uh -huh. and sometimes they just walk away from, even though they, they scored the audition, they scored the role, they walk away from whatever they, it is that they earned. So, in which instances can a production company forgive someone from walking away, whereas to what is not forgivable? What, what are the do's and don'ts when you score an audition? What do you mean walking away, like not accepting the role? Or, okay, or... let's say uh, I'm not doing the role anymore. I decided I'm going to go on a trip to Chicago. I'm going to go have some fun with my friends. I'm not going in for just one line. No. Or maybe he got a better role in a huge production and it wouldn't be fair. Like you were telling me, ah, fair. Uh, anyways, I'm going to let you elaborate more on that. I don't want to take away the punch. So, you know, One of the things is, um, and, and, I, and I tell this to actors when they come in, for workshops, it's um, as an acting. It, it's 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 art, right? So we're in in an artistic field, and uh, but it's also a business. That's why they call it show business. And you have to be able to do the two. You have to be a wonderful artist, but you have to recognize the fact that it is a business. And when you come into audition. You have to uh, you have to give that confidence to whoever is auditioning you that you are going to be responsible and are going to you know come in and, and act professionally that you are a professional. So we take that for granted. Uh, therefore, if you come in and audition and then refuse the role or or you know call a few days later and, and, and retract and not want to do it, you have to have a good reason because otherwise you've just wasted people's time uh, and people have to recast you. So it's, it's not forgivable if you're behaving in a non-professional way. I don't know if that's what you were asking, but yeah. And it has happened and it has happened, not often, but it's happened when, uh, somebody will um, get cast and then uh, the role doesn't shoot maybe for three or four weeks. And by the time it gets to that, they say, well, no, I've decided that I'm going to, I don't know, move to Europe or whatever and, and uh, not show up or, or, or um, let, let their agent know that they're not going to do the role on short notice 
So no, that's a big no-no. It doesn't happen often, but that just reeks of unprofessionalism. For the sake of the audience's education, because in our audience tonight, there are actors as well, and some of them are experienced, some less experienced. So it's just, it's nice that they know what the industry, you know, expects in terms of professionalism when you're going into an audition room and what you're getting yourself into, because it's your, your entire life as an actor is going to follow you. Whichever impression you make, whether it's good or bad, it's going to get around the industry and it won't be long. But, you know, acting is a profession. Okay. And I've, I've spoken to some, you know, young, young people or even older people who, who uh, call or come in or want some advice. And I remember uh, this young man who was telling me that uh, his big passion was acting and, and uh, he wanted to know, you know, what steps to take and, and how to go about it and so on and so forth. And uh, I asked what his availability was like in the next few months because there were some projects coming up. And he said, well, I'm, I'm going back to school. And I said, well, that's wonderful. You know, it's great. I said, so what are you, what are you going to school for? You know, which acting goes, oh, no, no, I'm going in for, I don't know, accounting or whatever. And I said, but you just spent a half hour telling me that acting is your passion and your life. And this is what you want to do for the rest of your life. And you're, you're going in for something completely different for three years where you won't be acting. Yeah, but as a backup. And, and I thought that was just very interesting because, you know, you don't have, if you want to be a, a doctor, you don't go into accounting as a backup before you go into medicine and vice versa. And acting is is a profession that many people choose many young people choose and they go to school for it and they train and they dedicate themselves and those are the people that you know like they that is their life and it's they're professional when they graduate from school they're professional and they go into the field and it's a profession Okay, so let, let's get to know Rosina a little bit on a personal level. You're from an Italian family, and your parents came from Italy to Canada. So, do you, Were you actually born in Canada, or were you born in Italy? I was born in Italy. In Italy? So you yes. came here at, at an early age. Uh, yeah, I was a baby, literally. <laughs> and I was, yeah. So, so I, grew, I grew up here. Yeah. So as a child, when you were growing up, what were your aspirations what did you want to be when you were, when you grew up? You know, I didn't really think about it all that much, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I used to enjoy going to school, and I used to enjoy reading, and I used to enjoy participating uh, in, in activities. Like, in retrospect, I, I realized, like, anything to do with either joining the school choir or joining you know, participating in, in the school plays or the school pageants when I was younger, I, I gravitated towards that. And I, lo I loved to get involved uh, in, in, you know, any activity of that nature. And uh, although I wasn't like a big extrovert or anything like that, but I wasn't shy. So if I had to go up and speak in front of a group of people or, or you know, recite something, it didn't, I wasn't shy about it. But um, when I was growing up, it, it, it you know, wasn't the sort of thing, I mean, maybe if I had been raised in Los Angeles, surrounded by people who were in the business all the time, one might say, oh, I'd like to do this or that. Uh, anything to do with um, show business per se didn't seem like a really viable thing. So it's not something I thought about, but I did gravitate towards it. And I would, uh, you know, I, I participated in, in a lot of things that had to do with, with art and with, uh, you know, with, with plays. And, and, and that's how we ended up, my, my two partners, Nadia and Vera as well, 
and that's how we ended up meeting in an acting workshop because you, you, if you follow your interests, it doesn't matter at what level you do them, somehow you will then find your way to what you are attracted to and passionate about. I, I believe exactly what you're saying. I believe that word per word, and that is the principle that I apply to my life in anything I do. And uh, you know very well, um, Rosina, before we went on air, you know that the passion I have for the whole industry, whether it be in broadcasting, mm -hmm. acting, behind the camera, in front of the camera, I absolutely love it. And I'm doing it for the passion, just like you're saying. And eventually, you know, if you actually believe in it, well, uh, you know, a lot, you're going to end up doing something. And it's not by sitting at home that uh, opportunities are going to find you. It's like you go out there and you put yourself in situations where you will come in contact with opportunities. And uh, uh, Don Emilio Zeno here is saying that he learned what the self-tape is all about five years ago because his son, Paul oh. Zeno, is an active actor and producer. And he would like to scream for me <laughs> to shut my loud mouth when penetrating our home studio, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Don, yeah. So, uh, do, do you know Paul Zeno? Do I know Paul Zeno? Yeah. He, he, yes. Have you auditioned him? Yes, at, uh, absolutely. Lee? Yes, oh. he's a fine young actor. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, Don Emilio, I'm sorry to say, but better actor than you. <laughs> <laughs> it's always it's always the child that ends up, ends up doing better than the, the parent. <laughs> the parent is always the wannabe, and the child carries on what the parent wanted to do all along. <laughs> so, Rosina, tell us, uh, before you uh, started Elite Casting, you were a, a reporter, an interviewer at a community <laughs> television station that was affiliated to CTV. Uh, tell yes. us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, I, again, because, because I was taking these acting workshops, um, these uh, people, this was a community channel, okay? And I don't even know if they have them anymore, but uh, CTV had a channel attached to it that was a community channel, and all the programming on it was community-oriented. Uh, and it was, you know, not commercial content per se. And um, the very first interview I did, they, they called, uh, it was the actress studio that we were attending at the time, and they called and said, we need someone to redo an interview with this artist uh, because it didn't turn out very well. So we'd like to try somebody else to do this interview. And so I was recommended and off I went and I interviewed this actor. I don't remember his name now, actor. I said actor, I meant artist. <laughs> he was, uh, he was uh, a visual artist and he uh, painted murals and he painted large murals, and his, his uh, big claim to fame was that he was, as per his own statement, the world's fastest painter, and he would paint with two arms. Anyway, long story short, I, I got to interview him, and he did some demonstrations, and, and, and it went very well. It was a half-hour interview uh, live, uh, recorded live. And uh, so that went well. And then they call me in, you know, to do uh, various interviews. I enjoyed it. Uh, so I interviewed a poet, I interviewed, you know, people from various walks of life, not always from the world of art. And eventually they gave me, they, they hired me and another young woman to do a live show but like live airing live with uh call-in <laughs> people oh, could call in that can be challenging and ask questions <laughs> and the whole exciting topic of this show was the services that <laughs> the station provided you know it was very cut and dry so you had to try to make the best of it and it's like oh you know we have uh, the accounting department is doing this and that and trying to make it exciting. And it was in English and French. And eventually I ended up doing it by myself. 
in both English and French. So I had to say everything, you know, in both languages. Well, we got to interview uh, people from different departments. And as you know, uh, you often will do like a, a little meet and greet ahead of time with the person so that you can talk a little bit about what you're, what you're going to talk about and get to learn a little bit from them what what they do so that you'll know what to ask them. And this one gentleman that was very animated and full of information and, and you know, telling me it was very interesting what he was telling and it was oh, great, this is gonna go over very well. So we, we get on air and I start talking to him and the man freezes. He just like went oh my God, totally I could just imagine. <laughs> it was like a deer caught in headlights and it was almost robotic. And I thought, oh my goodness. So, you know, as you know, live, you never know what's going to happen. Exactly. Right? <laughs> and then the call-ins that, you know, you never know what the heck they're going to call or ask you about. And But it was a great experience and, and I enjoyed it. <laughs> Well, maybe while he froze as a robot, the song by Styx came on, Mr. Roboto. So maybe he just wanted to I emulate wished. the moves. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Rosina, tell us a little bit about your passion for painting. I understand you're a very talented painter. You've had your work exhibited in uh, exhibitions, such mm -hmm. as the last one at Mont Saint-Hilaire. So tell us a little bit about your passion for painting and how that all came about. Um, you know, I, as I said, I've always loved art, uh, but visual art, uh, drawing and painting, uh, is not something that occurred to me as something I could do. So I dabbled it in a little bit, but like never really thought of pursuing it seriously or in any way, shape or form. Uh, but I always sort of kept getting into a little, um, getting back to it over the years. And maybe what, maybe must be about 15 years ago, uh, I decided with a friend of mine that we were going to paint with oil paints, which is something I had never done before. And I said, well, why not? Let's just do it. You know, we were both passionate about art and said, it doesn't matter. We're good, we're bad, we're miserable. It doesn't matter. We'll just do it. And in we went, and it was like you know a fly to to uh, what do you call it? a fly to 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 fly paper. It's like you know it just <laughs> stuck to it, and it's I've been doing it now for fifteen years, and and I just love it. Well, you went in there thinking that you were not good enough, and that you weren't good at it. But you know, Rosina. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead, elaborate on that. Yeah, it's like you know, you're saying it's something I, I feel like doing and I'd like to do it and and I I think I'm gonna enjoy it and I don't care if I'm not good, you know, because I had no reason to think I was good or, or you know, for there was no reason to think I was because I hadn't done it. And uh plus I thought it was something that just came spontaneously to people and and you know, anything, nothing comes spontaneously. You might have, you might be more predisposed to it or, you know, have, you know, more of, of a knack for it. But everything that you do, no matter what it is, you do have to put in work. And, uh, but when it doesn't feel like work, it's because you're doing what you should be doing. Well, back in the day, you thought you weren't good enough, but we're going to show the audience just how great you've become. <laughs> we're going to be showing some of your works over here. From my like last exhibition, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead and explain this to me because this, this, folks, is not a picture, by the way. It is actually yeah. a painting. So, Rosina, go ahead and tell yeah. us what you were trying to portray here in the mood that you captured. So, um, one of one of the topics that I love to paint uh, is rainy days, various forms of rainy days. So, I've, I've done, you know, a whole series of uh, from the perspective of being a passenger in a car. So it's through a windshield on a rainy day. 
because um, for me anyway, uh, a painting is, is about the mood that you create. And I find that rainy days just have a mood all their own. And so this is, uh, this is uh, St. Joseph Boulevard, somewhere along St. Joseph Boulevard on a rainy winter's day. And those raindrops just look absolutely convincingly real. Uh, I know every chef has a secret to his uh, spaghetti sauce and you have your <laughs> secret to your works as a painter. But one thing's for sure, you've done an excellent job uh, depicting what raindrops look like. You did a great job with that. Well, thank you. And well, here how, they are again. <laughs> and he, okay, so uh, talk to us about this painting, Rosina. This painting is... Uh, Somewhere in the in the plateau, so somewhere along uh, Saint Hubert, somewhere, again on a on a rainy night, and viewed uh, from the perspective of being behind uh, the windshield of a car, and uh, you know it's it's uh, light atmosphere mood is is basically what I go after and when something just grabs me and is like oh you know I love this and and then I go off and paint it so yeah more rain and this is an absolutely great uh, depiction a nice portrait let me guess who that the subject is on this painting here. somebody looks familiar somebody maybe the glasses you know? Maybe the glasses are giving it away. So go ahead, Rosina, tell us what were you, you were thinking when you were actually yeah. uh, depicting this picture here. Well, you know, here's an occasion where you don't want it to rain. So uh, <laughs> I call this one selfie. So it's uh, Sounds right. a self-portrait <laughs> of my selfie. So, yeah, that would be me on the beach. I, as much as I love painting uh, moody rain scenes. I also just love the beach uh, and, you know, sunshine on a beach. And yeah, yeah. so that, that, would be, that would be a self-portrait. I've always been impressed in how artists such as yourself can reproduce the shadows, the way light is reflecting on us. There are some areas that are more lit than others. You see on your right shoulder, you get that shadow. Mm -hmm. And uh, the streaks in your hair, and then you get the uh, the uh, the details on your cheeks. I, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted with that. And hats off to you that you can actually put on paper what you see with your eye. It's one thing to take a picture, but it's another thing to actually paint it out. That is just something that totally blows my mind. I'm totally impressed with that. Because uh, one of the things about painting is to paint what you see. So you have to have a really strong and, and train yourself to see what's there and not what you think should be there. So you, you know, if you, if you, I give you an example of when, if you're painting snow and it's white uh, and you think it's supposed to be white because it's snow, but if you look, it's not white. There, you need tons of colors to paint snow. And so you need to train your eye to observe and to paint what you see with your eye and not what you see with your head. You're absolutely right, because in snow, when you take a good look at snow, there are tones of blue tons in of there. Colors, tons of colors. And, yeah. and plus, especially in the daytime with the reflection of the sun, you can get a whole bunch of colors in there. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. you, you need a trained eye, an eye that's very aware of what's going around you, because a lot of people, snow's white, you know, so big deal. But there's more to it than meets the eye, as you're saying. Let's take a look, uh, look at another picture here. How about this? Mm-hmm. That, that would be our city, Montreal, full of bicycles. <laughs> this um, is a laneway near, near my home. Uh, and interestingly enough, the, the bicycle that's in the foreground here uh, was abandoned. I oh. mean, I, I painted it then, but then I observed it over a period of months, and it was just abandoned there. It was never picked up. But what, what attracted me here again is because it had been raining and there's reflection on the pavement. And with the reflection, you get the reflection of colors 
and and that again creates a really interesting mood and we also have this one uh -huh. here last but not least uh yeah. this again here we go we're talking about snow and there you have it so um, tell us all about this picture and what inspired you to, to paint this well this is a huge expanse of fields because it's a rural area it's um saint matthieu the, i forget the what but it's um and it's a you know huge rural area and i what attracted me was the uh, juxtaposition of the nature which are the fields and the smokestacks in the distance and it, you know very industrial and pollutants actually with the uh what was pristine snow but also at a time in the day when the when the sun has is it just about set and the colors and the shadows uh that create this very special mood and and even the polluting smoke has its own beauty and that's what attracted me to it I can't hear you now. There's, a, ghost, there's, oh. a, ghost, there's a ghost in the machine. Shh, oh, okay. Now I hear you. I'm sorry. The microphone was on mute for some reason. This microphone decides to mute itself. Um, who are the artists that have influenced you over the years most? Because you've been painting for 15 years, and I'm sure you've had a slew of artists that have influenced you, whether local or artists going back into the... 18th 19th century well uh, the the uh, group of artists that that really totally fascinate me are are um, the the um, impressionist painters because uh, what they did was sort of break away from the traditional classical form of painting to exactly an impression uh, colors and light and all the impressionist painting painters I deeply admire and and when I see their work when I have the good fortune to be able to view them live it just takes my breath away and more specifically um, somebody like Vincent van Gogh who kind of falls in a category all by himself uh, the, the colors and, and the movement and I mean you, you look at his paintings and it just uh, stirs your insides just by looking by, by seeing the colors and, and what he's done you know and it's hard to explain it because uh, sometimes his forms are very simple and it's you know not very detailed uh, and it's not like lifelike reproduction of things but he captured or created a mood and an emotion, and it stirs that in, in the viewer. So, yeah. We have a, an admirer that just popped up here. Patty, if you can put her again, she's got the same last name as our guest. It happens to be her niece, Sabrina. Oh. <laughs> so Sabrina has some nice things to say about you, Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> My lovely Sabrina. <laughs> so I've our... actually painted Sabrina. But you have yeah, okay. Yes, I have. That's yes, too I bad have. we don't have it handy. Yes, it would have been don't. nice to see her. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so our producer has a fascination with the rain and the stops that you paint, you portray in your paintings. So I just thought I would mention that to you. And actually, I've become quite a fan myself with your uh, the, the 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 depiction of when it's raining, the way you reproduce rain is just. I can understand Jenny where she's coming from. Oh, the light at dusk, yeah, and my stop signs. There you and go. you have one of the paintings that I see way in the distance. I, maybe you'll show it later. But, I, you know, I like to paint um, my surroundings. And I spent many, many years on Saint Laurent, the office being there, uh, and walking al along Saint Laurent all seasons and Prince Arthur. And so I've, I've, a lot of my paintings are in that 
neck of the woods. They're inspired from Sailor Rock, Prince Arthur. Yeah, the, the plateau area and other areas of Montreal uh, with the snow, with the slush, that to me has its own beauty. You know, you may not want to be walking in the slush, but it is beautiful. If it, it, it's the mood that it creates, it's the nostalgia of, of winter, maybe winter of our childhood, I don't know, but there's a certain nostalgic beauty that I, I want to portray in my works. When you're looking through the window and you see the slush in the street, it's a lot of fun. But when you're walking in that slush with your sneakers, especially these, these <laughs> young kids that refuse to wear boots, maybe they find that a little less fun. Maybe they do. <laughs> but you know, the young kids, they don't, feel, they don't feel the cold. They don't feel the slush. I remember they're young. Back, they're, you know. I remember back in my day, it was like maybe minus 20 degrees. And my friends, because I always wore the winter jacket. I was, I was always the type that was cold all the time. But I'd see my friends minus 20. They got these jeans on, running shoes on, a white T-shirt, the leather jacket, which is about mm -hmm. as thin as a piece of paper, is all opened. No hat, no gloves. And they're in the cold, like shivering. But hey, it's cool to wear a leather jacket. <laughs> In the winter time, when it's That's minus right. twenty. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Rosina, do you prefer oil, acrylics, or any type of other uh, paint? Oil is on? my medium of of yeah. Oil, oil painting is my medium. Okay, so why do you prefer oil over um, let's say I just acrylic? Do. I just do. <laughs> I just do. I just do. Um, I started with oil. I've, I've painted with acrylic as well. Acrylic dries faster. Exactly. Um, and it, it's, it's just, it's a different medium. Oil is, is much more pliable, uh, much more flexible. You, you know, you don't have to commit to, you know, whatever you do, you, you can change it. So I, I just find it, it, it agrees with my, personality we kind of work well together oil and i there is i don't know if this is a myth i've heard about this and i just wanted to check this out with you a lot of people say that they're going to see a painting there's going to be maybe 12 13 paintings and someone who's used to seeing your work is going to instantly be able to recognize maybe not 100 percent of the time but maybe 80 percent of the time they're going to see a canvas they're going to say oh that's rosina bucci right there there's actually a story that is related to that because you were saying someone was walking by and saw a painting. She, yeah. anyways, I'll let you tell the end of the story. I don't want to blow it. So what happened in that instant that she was walking by and saw your painting? Yes. So, uh, you know, you, first of all, you can have 10 people painting the exact same thing. Uh, and, you know, everybody has their own little, uh, their own little way of doing things. And we all have, it may not be obvious right away, but we all have our own little trademarks. And um, I paint with a group of people. And, you know, if I walk into a room with paintings um, on different easels and the people aren't there yet, uh, even if I haven't seen the paintings before, I can pretty much guess who's going to be where because you kind of get a sense of, of their style. So what happened was um, this uh, artist that I had uh, painted with and, and we'd exhibited together, uh, then I lost sight of her. She uh, went away and then, you know, I lost sight of her for, for a couple of years, for two or three years. And um, I had an exhibition on St. Catherine Street with, uh, uh, with a group of other artists and I had put, uh, we put a couple of paintings in the window of each of us and other paintings indoors. So I had put a big painting that was a recent painting in the window. And it was not, it was not cars with rain, which is what she had seen, what she was familiar with. But suddenly there she is, she walks into this uh, space and said, oh my gosh, I thought it might be you. I saw that painting and I said, that is so much like Rosina's work. 
and I wanted to come in to see what else there was. And, and sure enough, she goes, it, it is your work. So she, you know, just in passing by, it reminded her of my style. And in fact, it was. That's totally amazing. <laughs> we just have time for one more <clears throat> topic to cover. Abstract painting. You know, I'm not a real kind of sort of art, but when I look at an abstract painting, I don't understand it. It's like, oh my God, you know I mean? It's an abstract painting and I'm trying to make sense out of it and I just can't figure it out. However, <laughs> you have a huge appreciation for abstract painting because there's more to it than actually meets the eye. So explain what your take on the abstract painting is. Well, abstract, uh, People have that perception, you know, like, oh, my goodness, anybody could do that. You know, I could do that or that looks like chicken scratches or whatever. And it's derogatory uh, comments about abstract because the perception is like it doesn't look like anything. So anybody could do it. And it couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, somebody who had seen some of my work, which which is figurative, uh, had asked me if I did any abstract and I said oh I said I'm not there yet as an artist to wow. go abstract and he says what what do you mean like if you can paint something like a, a face that looks like a face uh, what do you mean abstract because abstract is really uh, it's pure creation and you have to be really good to create something that has great composition, that has mood, that has, you know, all of this uh, without any point of reference. You know, so it's not like a sunset. We've all seen a beautiful sunset. And so if you see a painting and you say, oh, wow, yeah, this is great. This is a gorgeous sunset. But if it's a bunch of, you know, splatters of colors, uh, for it to, you know, for it to, grab your attention it it has to have something and you've got to be good as an artist to know to to be able to create something abstract and somebody like Rothko for example who just his paintings are color planes so it's like a huge painting maybe six by eight feet or more and it'll be three colors that just look like they're floating on <laughs> on the on the canvas. Amazing. And you know, it's like, oh, you just grab, you know, and, and put three stripes and you're done. But no, you know, if you sit in front of a Rothko, I've I've heard people say they they they've sat in front and and cry. Oh wow. Because it 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 just does something to you. So yeah, that that's that's my thoughts about abstract art. It's 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 uh, very challenging to produce. Rosina, <clears throat> this show has gone by like a lightning. It's we're really, done. Really fast. We're done. Yeah, you're kidding me. We're done and we're done. <laughs> we're done so, and we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd just throw that rhyme in there. So I get a passing grade. You love it. I love Great. it. Yes. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Rosina, in her closing comments. Um, what advice do you give anybody, whether it's in the acting business or it's um, to be a painter in life in general, what advice do you give to someone? Honestly, it may sound really simple, but it's if you want to do something, if it's something that appeals to you, that, 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 that interests you, just do it. Just do it. Uh, it doesn't matter if you think you're good or you don't think you're good or if people you know, what are people going to think or say or why or don't even just go ahead and do it. If you want to act, if you've always wanted to act, doesn't mean that you have to be in a big movie. Just, you know, go join a, a join a local theater group, an amateur group, participate, just do it. And you'll never know where it can take you because the only time you fail is if you don't try. You're exactly right. I go along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> this, this, this is why I do what I do every week. Uh, every week, every month, I, I keep doing it, and I go along the lines that you're doing. There's, you know, there's nothing better than actually doing something and getting a satisfaction that you actually accomplished it. 
Why do we leave room for regret? There's no room for regret. You want to do something, do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you'll surprise yourself. Exactly. You will surprise yourself more than anybody else. Rosina, thank you so much for being on the show. Please do stand by because we got our meet and greet at the end of the show. If you want to say goodbye to the audience and thank them for tuning in, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, maybe I'll get to read some of the comments afterwards. Yes, uh, I... It's been a pleasure to share <laughs> my thoughts. And the Rob. comments. <laughs> uh, Rosina, thank you so much. So stand by. We'll be uh, right with you in a second. There you have it, folks. That was Rosina Bucci. She's a, a casting director. She's at the Elite Casting. For those of you who have missed the show or have tuned in late, we got some great news. You can go out to the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel, go onto my personal Facebook page, and on Twitch, you can go back and watch the show again. You can read the comments that were put up, and you can also add comments. We'll forward them to Rosina or to whoever and we'll be able to answer these questions. Join us this upcoming Wednesday at noon hour out of the box. Uh, you can watch the show on uh, the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel on Esther's Breeze and on my personal Facebook page. A reminder that every Saturday you have the extended version of noon hour out of the box at accessradio.ca. That's access, A-X-I-S, radio.ca and you can catch our show between noon and 3 p.m. every Saturday. Next week on our show we'll have producer, director, photographer and co-founder of Senza Media Film Festival and the Celebrity Chef Cooking Show Sima Aurora. So once again we thank you so much for tuning into our show. Be good, be nice, stay safe and we'll see you next week same time, same place. Good night everybody.